Sometimes on Dead Last, we focus on the works of a particular director and their filmography, but there's a bit of an issue with that when it comes to Wes Craven. Y you see, we we've already discussed his nightmare works on the Nightmare Ranking, and we did the Screams on the Scream Ranking, and, and it's pretty clear that those would be the tops, but what about the rest of Wes? What about the rest of the horror content that doesn't include Freddy or Ghostface? Well, I've rounded up that list of movies. Like, it's pretty much everything except for his TV movies, non-horror stuff, and of course his one porn movie from the 70s. Um, this is the list, and it, it's pretty varied. Like, there's all kinds of quality going on in this one. And as usual, I sent that out to my patrons at patreon.com slash movie timelines. And these guys answered the call. We had more than a couple of first time rankers, uh, which is always nice to see. And, and again, you can join uh, by going there and becoming a patron for, for like $1 a month. There were 39 entries this month in total, including mine, which means that the best score that a movie can get would be 39 points. That's if every person ranked the same film in number one. And the worst score that it could get would be 507 points, which would be if everyone ranked the same film in dead last. Here worth 13 points. So now let's see how Craven stacks up without his two biggest franchises in a little something we like to call the rest of Wes. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Coming in at dead last, the bottom of the barrel here, and this got pretty low, but it wasn't a blowout or anything because scoring was all over the place this month. So with 418 points, our dead last is The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. It did actually get the largest number of dead last votes as well, with 10 of them, and the best score that it got was third place, which it got one time. And I had this one pretty close. I, I put it in 12th, although I have to say I, I, I love that it starts with this film is based on fact. And look, the behind the scenes story of this is pretty indicative of what you're going to see. Craven disowns this movie because he was only partially done filming it when the studio pulled the plug on it. But then when Nightmare became a huge hit, they got him to finish it. But only using what had already been shot, which is why it's so littered with senseless flashback footage. And when I mention flashbacks, and I feel like I can't emphasize this enough, the dog has a flashback. Like they give him the wavy lines and everything. Like I can just hear him saying, I remember the day like it was yesterday. And, and I also love that they're just like, oh yeah, Pluto? Uh, he, uh, he didn't die, sure. Somehow, Pluto returned. And, you know, Rachel's death is hilarious because she was originally meant to fall into a pit of spikes, but the actress didn't want to be killed off in case they did a third one, so she convinced Wes to go more ambiguous with it. So instead, it's just, it's kind of silly. Like, she hits her head on a rock, dead. Um, plus, I guess Wes didn't like the actor who played the Reaper, so he had Nick Wirth, Bruno from Swamp Thing, come in to dub all of his lines. And once I knew that, it was all that I could hear. <laughs> Reaper don't get fooled like Papa Joop! Oh no! And oh, I love, love that they went through the trouble of bringing back Bobby from the first movie and were like, here he is, and he's traumatized. And we see all this stuff from his point of view. And then like 10 minutes in, he's like, uh, I'm going to exit the movie now. And then we never see him again. Flea bag, flea spade, garbage hound. <laughs> Going down to our number 12 movie, and it was a fairly big drop down, a full 30 points, because with 388 points, we have My Soul to Take. It took the dead last spot eight times, only two less than Hills 2, and did get one second place ranking. I had it nowhere near there, though, because this was my dead last, and, and I think that I should clarify how I approach these lists. Like, 
Usually I put the ones I love up top and then move on to the ones that I just enjoy. Sometimes that includes movies that I consider bad but still had fun with. When it comes to the lower movies, I, I usually put the ones I don't like and just bore me slightly above the ones that I don't like and frustrate me. Like I'd rather it be dull than have it make me annoyed with it. And this movie annoyed me. And you have to consider that before this, Wes had done the Scream trilogy and then pushed for some respectability with music from the heart and red eyes. And sure, he had cursed in there, but he was on this upward trajectory. And then he took a five year break from filmmaking and came back with this. It's just a frustrating movie because it's just every cliche from every horror movie sort of rolled into one. And I feel like Craven has completely forgotten how people talk to each other. God hears you wherever you are. If things get too hot, just turn on the prayer conditioning. R really? And it's like he just took a portion of everything and threw it into one movie. It's a dash of shocker, a bit of nightmare, a lot of scream, and even a touch of deadly friend. Like he came back from his break and was sitting in front of a typewriter and didn't know where to start. And he just went into it and was so unsure of what he wanted that he threw a little of it all in there. But here's the thing. A little later on, you're going to hear me say something similar about another movie, except I'm going to be a bit more favorable about it. And that's fair. But sometimes you go to the fridge and you open it up and you just have a bunch of random ingredients and you throw them all together and you're like, hey, this actually worked out. OK, this tastes pretty good. I locked out. But then. Other times, you wind up with some weird pickles and cookie crisp taco and you realize what a horrible mistake that you've made. And that's what this movie is. Some pickles and cookie crisp thrown into a taco shell with some cocktail sauce on top. Our number 11 movie had another solid drop down, M more than 50 points as we go all the way down to 336 points now. And we're looking at our first deadly of the batch, Deadly Blessing. It had way less dead last votes, only three rankings had it there. But to show how split people were on this one, and, and a lot on this list actually, it actually managed to reach first place twice. And here's the deal, I had this one in 10th place, and that's pretty low, but I don't mind this one, actually. I think it's kind of all right. It starts off on the right foot as Berryman just tosses that painting in the beginning, and I had to rewind it like three times to watch that thing fly. It's hilarious. And yeah, I think I'm kind of ruined with Ernest Borgnine. I just can't watch him without thinking about Super Fuzz, which isn't really a bad thing when you think about it. But here he is wearing this little Amish beard and stuff, and I'm just thinking about him sitting on top of a giant ball of bubble gum. And it's so strange seeing Sharon Stone in this a good 12 years before her big success in Basic Instinct. Like, I know I've seen her in other stuff besides this that predates her breakout, but you never really think about her showing up in an old low-budget horror flick. But the issue with this film is that it's so unsure of what it's doing. It seems like it might be a slasher flick at times. It dances around having there be supernatural stuff going on. And maybe it seems like it wants to be about cults. Like from a historical perspective, it's, it's pretty clear to see that this is a transitional film for Craven. With Hills and Last House, he was clearly going down this road of shock, horror, and exploitation. And this showed a more mainstream side and an ability to handle a more classic style. But perhaps he dialed it back a little, like a little too much. This one could have used a bit of subversiveness from one of those, particularly in the middle when it gets into this kind of sluggish zone. And it's also wild just how much he ripped himself off with the bathtub scene for Nightmare. It looks so similar. But then it's just really, really boring. And then there's this completely inexplicable and pointless ending 
which I guess Craven didn't want to do, but the studio insisted upon. And it's a shame because the twist that they gave you with the movie's main mystery is actually pretty solid and it works well enough. I mean, it, it's fairly out there, but it's a satisfying ending to where they were going. But then they just do this wonky incubus thing out of nowhere and it makes everything that came before it not even really matter. Moving on now, we're looking at our number 10 film here. And this is the first close call because there's only five points difference between Blessing and this one. And we only dropped down to 331 points. And it's a pretty big departure with Craven. And it's a vampire in Brooklyn. It got ranked in dead last five times, and the highest score that it got was third place, which it took three times. And only two movies on this list didn't get a single first or second place ranking, and it was Hills Have Eyes 2 and this one. And I had this one a bit lower since it was my number 11, and this is one that I just can't really enjoy all that much, but I can't really bring myself to hate either. Like, I, I think that they tapped West for this based on the fact that he showed some aptitude for doing urban-based horror with people under the stairs, but this movie makes it clear that it really wasn't particularly in his wheelhouse, especially dealing with a persona as big as Eddie Murphy, who was like, hey man, I do one accent, and one accent only, so if it sounds like I'm from Zamunda, then that's what you're getting. Interesting. I've been stabbed, and I've been hanged, and I've been burned. Even broken on the rack once, but I've never been shot before. It features one of my least favorite filmmaking conceits, and that's the voiceover from a narrator basically just explaining things to you so they don't have to show it, I guess. And everything in this one is just so clunky. Like, like the cop, you never talk about your mother much. Can you give me some exposition? Other cop, sure, here's all the exposition you need for later. But this movie's absolute biggest problem is that it just can't seem to figure out what it wants to be. Is it an Eddie Murphy comedy film? Or is it a somewhat serious Wes Craven film? Like one minute it's trying to sort of have a Fright Night vibe, but the next you have Murphy done up like an Italian guy, like, like it's some sort of half-assed clumps sequel. A and I guess that's all Craven's fault. Murphy had a script and wanted to do a straightforward horror flick with little to no comedy where he could just act, basically treating it like he does the vampire character very seriously. But then Craven wanted him to add comedy to it and they added stuff like the preacher character and the Italian guy for Eddie to crack jokes and give it more comedy. And the sad thing is that I think if they had just dumped all that stuff and went with the more Craven-y vibe for the whole thing, it would have been a more successful film overall. That stuff is just so close to working, even though Murphy doesn't really help here, and you can just chalk all of that up to Angela Bassett doing the thing. She gives it an air of respectability that it really doesn't deserve and elevates it more than a little. And you can see her really acting up a storm and you're like, hey, maybe, maybe this is gonna turn it around. And then you realize you're like in minute 18 of watching Murphy in yet another fat suit and it's like the movie is just farting in your face ass is good evil's good and ass is good uh -huh. and if you get your piece of evil ass whoo all right our number nine movie also dropped down considerably with a 33 point drop and it's the second part of our deadly journey but this time it's not a blessing it's a friend like blessing this one also got three dead last rankings but no first place votes, and the best that it could do is a single second place nod. And I have this one in sixth place, and, and I can confidently admit that a good portion of that is old fashioned nostalgia. I definitely saw this one on cable 100 times back in the day, and remember wanting my own BB to crush the balls of the jerks in my neighborhood. And keep in mind, this was Wes's first theatrical feature after Nightmare, so everyone was really into this one as being the next big thing in horror and was going to give us a character to rival Freddy, and instead what we get is BB? 
And this was originally meant to be a simple PG rated story about the relationship of Paul and Samantha, but I guess it didn't test well and people wanted more violence from Wes, something more like Nightmare. So they went and reshot a bunch of more violent scenes to add gore and then the reshoots just gave it this really weird uneven feeling. The added scenes were the dream sequence with her father, the bit in the intro with the thief, the whole basketball bit, and of course, that ridiculous ending. And it's kinda silly too that Craven has two movies that are two words that start with deadly and both of them have completely random final scenes that the studio insisted upon. And I just can't get over the voice that they went with for, for BB. Like, it's actually Charles Fleischer, the voice of Roger Rabbit, but it's basically a sort of a cross between Gizmo and Stripe, and I was convinced it would be Frank Welker, but nope, not him. But still, there, there's a certain amount of charm to this. It's just stupid and weird, but it's not dull, and there's aspects of this that I do really like. And here's a silly extra note. The, the school that Paul goes to is USC, and it's the same location Wes would return to a few years later with Nightmare 3 as it substituted as Weston Hills. I, I will also say that the basketball scene is possibly one of the most hilarious special effects fails in all of history. Like, wh what is this supposed to be right here? And, oh, speaking of special effects fails, about that ending, it's supposed to be a robot under her skin, but whoops, what's this here? Just the person's real skin underneath, a drastically different tone than the Samantha skin it's supposed to be breaking through. Baby. Our number eight movie had another drop, but not as drastic of one since it was only 24 points, and it ended up with 274. And wow, were people split here with the movie Cursed. It took that dead last spot three times, but was also ranked in first place four times. I've got this one right around where it sits though, since I have it in ninth place. And I, I don't know what to make of this film, but I guess it's fine. The, the interesting thing about this one is that when we're doing this list and removing the Scream movies, there's three of those in between the last film and this. It's like he did Vampire in Brooklyn, and then three Scream movies in a row. And then granted, Music from the Heart was in there too. But by this point, it had been 10 years since he did any other horror movies. So by this point, Wes's style had been roundly determined by that series. And you can feel those influences here to the point that you could very easily describe this as Scream with Werewolves. And Knowing how the rest of his filmography goes, I feel like a lot of the whole Scream style comes more from Kevin Williamson than it does Wes himself. Because here's the more controversial thing that I may say in this episode, but Wes Craven doesn't particularly have his own style. I, I feel like a good portion of the films presented here, if shown to a complete horror newbie, wouldn't be easily identifiable as the work of the same director, whereas the movies of, say, John Carpenter or David Cronenberg would be. Now, I'm not stating that as a negative thing or a slam against him, but it's something that I've noticed here. And with Cursed, one thing you will notice is the sheer level of bad wig in this film. It's crazy. Like, like what is this on Michael Rosenbaum's head? And then they throw one on Jesse Eisenberg as well. And one of the worst things is knowing that the original cut of this film had a Rick Baker werewolf, which makes me unreasonably angry, particularly after seeing the transformation that I can't believe that someone saw and said, yeah, okay, that, that, that works, put that in. And right after they linger on that shot of the classic Wolfman, like, like they're trying to sort of say, oh, hey, remember how silly werewolves used to be? And meanwhile, that looks around 50 times better than this thing. I have to give it silly credit though for having a werewolf that swears and flips the bird. She's got bony ass and fat thighs 
and bad skin. We're on our number seven movie now, and this is another one where it was a short drop because there's only six points in between. And I have to say, the reaction to this one was shocking. And with 268 points, it's the last house on the left. This is completely crazy here because it did get three dead last votes, but was ranked number one nine times. The most of any movie on this list. I don't think we've ever had an instance where the movie with the most amounts of number one votes was ranked as low as seventh place. That, that's insane. And I put this one in fourth place myself. And here's the thing. I understand some of the flack that this one gets. I understand the negative reactions to it. The subject matter of the whole rape revenge genre of horror can be a tough thing to sit through. And this one is pretty hard to watch, if that's something you have an aversion to. And one of the more interesting things about it is that it was originally meant to be a hardcore film, and all of the cast and crew had signed on knowing that. These were all actors prepared to make an X-rated movie, and then they made the decision to not be hardcore just before shooting, and, and I'm not quite sure that I can really picture this movie as a hardcore film, and I'm really kind of thankful that they didn't go that route and kept it a bit more subtle, because I have to say, I do think it's a bit more subtle than people are expecting. Uh, that scene, the part that most people are skeeved out about with this movie is not quite as over the top as you may be expecting. And I think that it works a bit like Texas Chainsaw in that regard, in that it convinces you that you've seen more than you actually have. And then there's that weird assortment of music choices. Most of them are just so bizarre and ill-fitting. <laughs> To me, that works in the film's favor. It's these mellow sort of folk tunes and pleasant things, and they put you a bit at ease and you drop your guard a bit before things get intense. And ultimately, this is not a movie that I enjoy watching. It's not fun, but it is pretty damn effective. I saw a couple of comments ranking this one low and commenting about how they felt like they needed a shower after watching it. And I agree, but I felt like that was actually points towards the movie for me. It created that vibe and atmosphere and did it well. But it's also kind of funny seeing a young Martin Cove just strolling around. And if we're talking about the tone of the music, which I think serves a purpose, the whacking, bumbling cops... I think do not. And now it's time for our number six movie. And this is another one that I couldn't believe how all over the place its rankings were. And with 258 points, we have the adaptation of the classic DC character, Swamp Thing. Oh, Swampy did get one dead last ranking, but also got two first places. And I didn't have this one in first, but I sure as hell had it in second. And I am not for one second going to insinuate that my regard for this film is not entirely coated with nostalgia. I saw this one so many times on cable when I was younger, and I made sure to watch it pretty much any time that it was on. It helped that I enjoyed the comic as well. And keep in mind, this was all before the whole Alan Moore restructuring of the character, and this movie was moderately true to that. I mean, there were some big changes, like Arcane is a whole different kind of character, and Cable, played by Adrian Barbeau, was a man in the books. But keep in mind, this was back in an era where if they cast a woman as a comic character that was a man, people's heads didn't explode in salty tears. And I'm also not going to pretend that the FX weren't total garbage and that the Swamp Thing suit isn't the goofiest thing ever put on film. But do you think younger Josh gave a damn? He did not. And as goofy 
as swampy was, the arcane boar monster thing at the end was even sillier. Like, what the hell even was that thing supposed to be? And did they really plan for the suit to rip so much that you could actually see the actor underneath? So yeah, I can totally see someone walking into this movie for the first time and watching it and saying, this is just trash and it's barely competent, so I'm going to rank it low. But I throw this on knowing it's just kind of garbage and I'm just filled with nostalgia and I think it's fun. It's still a fun movie. You've got David Hess going over the top and Nicholas Wirth doing what, what he does and then a little mini monster version of him. You've got Ray Wise being charming and Louis Jordan just giving it more than he had to. I, I feel like I don't even need to mention Adrian because we all know that she's awesome, but can we talk about Reggie Batts as Jude? This was this kid's only movie and only acting gig, and I think he just sells that role. Uh-huh. Here comes trouble. I would love to see him show up again. Like, give me a new Swamp Thing movie or show and put Jude in there with Batts in the role because because I checked he's still out there he isn't an actor anymore he's like a self-help and fitness guy who, who seems to be doing okay for himself and and looks great bring back Jude damn it oh shit. there goes the neighborhood next up number five and this was another big drop down after three movies that were somewhat close to each other, it's getting pretty hot now because it fell 43 points down to 215 for The Hills Have Eyes. This is one that you can see that people felt less strongly about than some of the others since it only grabbed one dead last, but also one first place spot. And I have to say, I thought this would do a little better. But of course, I'm one of the people that held it back from doing better, though, since I had it in seventh. And here's the deal with this one. I didn't see this for a very long time. I kept hearing about it, and it was talked up as this horror classic, but I just never got around to it. And when I finally got around to watching it, I did not see what the fuss was all about. It was kind of slow, a bit cheesy, and just didn't really feel all that effective. I, I walked away from watching it like, that's what has this big reputation? Like, I, I know that it was partially high expectations not being met, but it still felt disappointing to me. And my opinion on the movie was pretty low. That being said, since I went in this time with much lower expectations, I got more enjoyment from it this time around. But I still find it to be kind of dull and doesn't take enough advantage of its unique location to build an atmosphere. You've got this remote desert setting and tons of opportunity to evoke this whole stranded feeling and the whole heat element and all of that, which I think is something that the remake actually did and did well, but I'm not getting here. But there's good stuff in here. There is something to be said about the whole dog getting revenge aspect of this that is pretty great, even if it occasionally borders on comedy. Like, the dog is getting revenge and planning things out. Like even taking the walkie talkie, like a dog knows what that's for. The biggest miss for me though, is the way that it doesn't take advantage of the sheer terror of the ending. The idea of a stolen baby that you're racing to save from being eaten sounds like it should be terrifying, but it just feels like a standard horror chase. And then the whole, we built a series of traps for the bad guy ending, feels like it's from another movie. And between this and Nancy booby trapping her home, it seems like a thing that Craven had a penchant for. It's, it's just kind of silly because you have these two like teenage characters and are portrayed as kind of useless through a good portion of the movie, suddenly just MacGyvering up everything in sight. <laughs> Coming in at number four. Oh, wait, what's this? We have a tie. That's right, two movies tied for third place, and each of them took 207 points. Only eight points down from The Hills Have Eyes. So this was close all around. But the two movies up for this 
are Shocker and Red Eye. Now, in order to get the winner of this toss-up, I had to go to the man himself, Mikey Rotella. M Mikey, what do you think? Which is our winner? What's up, everybody? My pick for this tiebreaker is Shocker. So that makes our number four movie with 207 points, Red Eye. Uh, this one did get two dead last rankings, but it was also put in first place four times. And I, I think Mikey made the right call here because I had this one all the way down in eighth place myself. And this is a tough one for me to rank because on one hand, it's probably one of his most competently made films and looks the most polished. But on the other hand, it's just not much fun to me. It just feels like this stock thriller script that could double out as a lifetime movie. That There's just not much about it that stands out or feels like here's a reason for this movie existing even though you've seen it all before. But like, all right, do you know how the movie Match Point gets talked about because it's by Woody Allen, but it's better than most Woody Allen movies and feels nothing like a Woody Allen film, so it's like he suddenly magically learned how to be a better filmmaker, but then forgot it all on his very next film? Yeah, th this, th this is like that. Like, you remember earlier how I said that if you showed his roster of movies to someone and didn't tell them that they were by the same director, I think this is the one that's the most stupefying because yeah, it looks great. The acting is all pretty solid. I mean, Jilly Murphy is doing his whole deal and doing it well. Brian Cox is playing a suburban dad, which is fantastic. Rachel McAdams is carrying that lead well and everything works fine. But it's not a movie that I particularly enjoy watching and not something that I would just throw on. Like, I don't think I've ever said, oh, hey, I'm in the mood to watch Red Eye. And there's seven movies that I have said that about, so I put those ones higher. Plus, be, be honest, did anything in this movie happen that took you by the slightest bit of surprise? Was there a single moment that you weren't expecting? There was basically one moment there that I was like, oh, that that's new, and it was them just straight up shooting a rocket at a building. But you know, one rocket's not going to cut it. So that leaves our number three movie with 207 points, and Mikey's say so it is Shocker. And you know, it, it deserves the edge here because it didn't get a single dead last. It's the first movie on the list to do so, but it did get five number ones. One more than Red Eye, so I think the right call was made. But Mikey, what was it that made you give Horace Pinker the edge? I love classic Craven, Shocker's awesome, balls to the wall, Looney Tunes cartoon style horror movie. Doesn't really make a lot of sense, but Horace Pinker is awesome. Mitch Pileggi does a great job. He's intimidating, he's badass, you're scared of him, even though he's like this screwball, ridiculous character. Uh, you got a Heather Langenkamp cameo in there, which you, you know, can never have a problem with. Love Heather. And uh, the one of the best soundtracks of all time, you got this 80s heavy metal, badass soundtrack with a Dream Warriors-esque title track in the super group, Dudes of Wrath's Shocker. Shocker! Shocker! We lead like lambs to the slaughter. I love it. It's badass. Shocker all day. I agree with all of that. And you know how I said that this had one more first place spot than Red Eye? Well, that one was mine because I love this movie. I saw it twice in the theater. It's the only movie on this list that I saw in the theater and I saw it twice. And, and look, this movie tells you right what it's going to be in the opening credits. It's essentially a mirror to the opening of Nightmare on Elm Street with Freddy making his glove. But instead, you have this Paul Stanley fronted goofy tune and silly tone. And you know it's like that but turned all the way up and then you have peter berg as the lead who says every line like he's holding in a fart don don is a family all right 
He, he, he's a really odd pick for a leading man, but I'm down with it. And I have this joke that I've used like 100 times, so get prepared to roll your eyes as I tell it again. But if you're watching Shocker and you don't like it, just wait 15 minutes and it'll be a completely different movie. And that's true for every 15 minutes of this since it just jumps from thing to thing to thing. And this is what I was talking about when I was discussing my, my soul to take because this is the other movie where it was just like, Wes was like, I have seven ideas that I want to do, but none of them are complete movies. So let's just throw them all into one and see what happens. And th this is no pickle taco. No, this is that awesome seafood pasta thing that my, my wife made that one time when she said that there was stuff in the fridge that we had to eat or it'll go bad. And it was like this amazing meal. This is like that, but with less capers. It, it, it's about a kid tracking a serial killer by seeing him in his dreams. But no, it's about a murderer stalking his prey by jumping from body to body and possessing them. But, but no, it's now about a ghost girl with a magical necklace that's fighting a ghost version of the killer. But no, no not now it's about the killer using electricity to travel around and also, I suppose, transform into a Barca lounger. But, but wait, now it's about a killer and a regular guy who suddenly have the ability to just jump into TV shows. And I have to squarely admit that I both love the over-the-top weirdness of this ending, but also realize that it makes next to no sense. Why do the TV programs react to them like they're, like they're a live event? Did they go back in time to the war? How does the whole thing with the room at the end work? It's in the TV, but it's also the real room? What does any of that mean? Does it matter? Uh, not to me. Num number one from me. Here's among you. Prepare. Check your perimeters. Check your perimeter. Check your perimeter. Check your perimeter. So there's only two movies left, and th this one wasn't doing too well for a while, but had a spectacular final two days of rankings coming in, which shot it from fourth place to second with 190 points. And it's The Serpent and the Rainbow. This is another one that didn't get ranked in dead last, but did get one 12th place nod, and was also ranked in first four times. And this is another one that I was less favorable to than the consensus, since I put it in fifth. And uh, again, with this true story thing, uh, is this like Hills Have Eyes 2 being based on fact? I, I mean, I suppose this one is a little closer to a true event than that one was, but, but come on. And right off the bat, it's jarring how different this feels compared to anything else that Craven has directed. It has an entirely different feeling than all of the other things that we've seen so far, like if you're watching them in order. But this one has one major thing holding it back for me, and that's the fact that it has a narration, which is just, it's just a personal thing for me, like, like I mentioned with Vampire. It's rarely used to good effect, and yeah, in here, it's essentially just a guy explaining what you're seeing on screen. Someone once said to me that narration is a trick that filmmakers use after the fact when they realize that they failed to convey what they needed to on screen and needed the narration so the audience can understand what's going on. If you remove the narration from this one, not only can you still get what's going on, but the atmosphere and mood are improved. So although this one isn't super interesting to me and it just kind of lags and is pretty damn predictable, I still think it's one of the most well put together of his films, even if it's just not that fun. About 80% of this movie is extremely forgettable and falls into that same sort of trap that Red Eye did for me. Like it looks great and I'm impressed with the technical aspects of it, but I'm also sort of falling asleep while watching it. But then you get to the finale. And I don't know if Wes was like, I was just saving all the crazy until now or, or what. It, it's like the producers only allowed him a certain limited amount of fun. And he was sitting there saying, well, if I stretch this out, the entire movie can be a little bit of fun or I can just use this all at once and have a good 15 minutes that are a blast. And I mean, like, the, the entire, like, hour and 15 minutes of this is all 
this is a true story and painfully serious. And then it ends with a telekinetic mind battle, although I guess it can be debated if it's real, but it may also be the only film in history to end with the hero majestically driving a nail through the enemy's scrotum. Don't, don't let them bury me. I'm not dead. So that makes our number one, the best of the rest of Wes. And this wasn't even close because this movie only got 159 points and it's The People Under the Stairs. No dead last votes again, but still got one 12th place. So every single movie on this list either got a dead last or 12th place vote, which is, is pretty unique. It also got eight first place spots. And again, I'll point out that it's one less than Last House on the Left which was in seventh place. And I gave this one third place because I think that this movie's a genuine hoot. And here's the deal. I didn't see this for a long time after it came out. Th this came out in 91, and I didn't see it until sometime in the mid 2000s. So, so my ranking on this one actually has nothing to do with nostalgia and mostly just for how enjoyable it is to watch and Keep in mind that this is from the year 1991, and it's a great example to bring up when people talk about how political the movies are nowadays, because this film is political as hell. It brings up issues about gentrification, racial identity, it's bringing up the class divide, everything. And it's interesting really because it's one of the only films on this entire list that seems like it's actually trying to say something. He's had some films that tiptoe around a theme, or some sort of social commentary, but here he just seems like he fully embraces it. And honestly, it made me wish that he did it more often because it makes this one a richer film. If it lags at times, it's, it still feels like he's trying to be timely and relevant. And it also fits with some of his other films stylistically. I, I think that Wes is at his best in a suburban setting as evidenced by Nightmare and Scream, obviously, but he seems more in his element there. And even though this is right in LA and has some inner city stuff uh, happening as well, it still has that same feel. But it shows one other thing. Wes works best when he really puts emphasis on characters. Uh, again, Freddy's obvious, but look at this list. Some of the most fun on here is based on characters. You have Horace and Shocker, and he's, and he's memorable. Even Hills had the clan, and of course, Michael Berryman as Pluto sticking out. But like, do you remember any of the characters from Serpent? A anyone from Red Eye? And I'm not saying, do you remember the actors? Do you remember their character names or anything about them? Not really, but here you not only have Fool and Leroy as pretty memorable characters, but you also have Roach and you have the evil couple who, who don't have names, but you sure as hell remember them. So yeah, I may not have put this one in number one myself, but I sure as hell understand it and I'm pretty happy about it. What happened? Burned in hell. Burn. So there you have it, the rest of Wes. The horror filmography of Wes Craven minus Nightmare and Scream. And, and let's take a look at how this turned out. And I'm, I'm not overly mad about this. There's only a couple on here that I'm really attached to. And I, I think the thing I learned here is that if you take out those two big franchises out of his roster, he, he, uh, he doesn't have a lot of gold in here. Uh, th th this list may have slightly marred my opinion of Craven as a director a, a touch. Let me know how you feel about it and tell me what your ranking would be or, or even how many of these that you've seen. L let's hear it. A and again, if you disagree with this ranking, please understand that it's the aggregate opinions of a bunch of people and you can be in that aggregate every month by going to patreon.com slash movie timelines and joining our little crew. Every month we get a different list of movies to rank and rate and discuss. It's actually a lot of fun. Also, please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying what you see and keep on tuning in. And we'll see you very shortly for another great one. Thanks a lot, guys, and bye-bye.